At the American Geophysical Union fall meeting, the Earth and Space Science community gathers both in New Orleans and online to network and connect and exchange the latest thinking about our world and beyond. The fall meeting program explores a wide range of topics such as climate change, solution science, equity in the research community, and much more. Since 1919, AGU's members have explored the deepest oceans and the furthest planets, and AGU TV is here to cover it all. Hello, I'm Atria Godfrey, and welcome to the first episode of AGU TV. I will be guiding you along as we kick off AGU's first hybrid meeting. With attendees gathering in New Orleans for the start of the in-person activities, we hope you will tune in each day as we are joined by special guests from the Earth and Space Science community. The AGU Fall Meeting theme this year is Science is Society, and in today's world, scientific discovery needs to be more than just for curiosity. Science is interwoven into the fabric of our society, and the work of AGU members continues to elevate Earth and space science to new levels of social impact. On today's show, we are honored to feature an interview between Nobel Prize winner Klaus Hasselmann and Guy Brasseur. Well, I first wanted to understand the basic theoretical principles of climate change. And please stay tuned as we take a look at a few of the institutions, missions, and companies at the forefront of the Earth and space science community that are making strides in pushing the boundaries in both discovery and solution sciences. But first, we are joined by AGU Executive Director and CEO Randy Pfizer to discuss AGU's strategic goals for the upcoming year. Randy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to having a great conversation with AGU TV. You've been the Executive Director and CEO for over a year now, having joined AGU during the pandemic. Tell us about what you are looking forward to as you attend your first AGU fall meeting in person. You know what I'm, I'm most looking forward to is meeting the community. Uh, it has been a year and a half as CEO, having great conversations with the community, but doing it all through Zoom um, or Teams. And this is not only the first opportunity I'm gonna have to meet the community as a whole in person, or at least in part in person, and what a wonderful, amazing event that the AGU Fall Meeting is with such incredible content. Um, and I'm just so excited to hear the science um, and all of the other elements that we build into this uh, great meeting. AGU strategic plan notes a number of strategic goals for the organization. Can you share your perspectives about how the plan and goals provide a different path for AGU's future and how you envision AGU's role in society under this new plan? Plan. The strategic plan actually drew me to the organization and to this opportunity. It is just a really bold um, a statement about how science can really impact society. And one of the things I love about it is it leans into the history of AGU. Um, and the work around discovery science and earth and space and keeps that foundation as a core of who we are as an organization, but begins to build the thread of how solutions from those discoveries can really change our society for the better. One of AGU's goals is to promote and exemplify an inclusive scientific culture. Can you talk about what that means and how AGU is doing this? In order to have the best solutions, you need the most diverse voices at the table really solving the problems. So AG is really leaned into ensuring that the earth and space sciences builds on diversity um, and inclusion as a part of our mission. We have incredible programs. In fact, we're launching one um, at AGU Fall Meeting called AGU Landing. And what this is doing is actually creating champions within institutions who are going to be um, pushing for diversity, equity, inclusion in their organization. And they create a cohort of people who will work together to help identify problems in their institutions and really begin to solve them. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here because the earth and space science is the least diverse science out there. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but AGU is committed to this. What do you believe are the biggest challenges for the earth and space science community right now? And how can AGU support the community against those challenges? Science in general right now is really focused in on 
um, ensuring that we are a trusted source for people. The biggest challenge I think that we have is disinformation that's out there at times that is contradicting real science with falsehoods and hyperbole and just questioning the, the authenticity and, and the point of view of science. And that's a real challenge. We need to break through that and we need to build relationships with communities of people who, for whatever reason, have chosen to question um, the science. Um, you know, it's important to question science, but it's one thing to use falsehoods and or really inaccurate information to, um, to push a different agenda. I really trust in the intellect of human beings that we can overcome this, and that's going to be really important for us as a science community to ensure people trust our work and trust our science. What are your hopes for the organization, for the Earth and Space Science community? My biggest hopes for, for AGU and the Earth and Space Science community is to really show and demonstrate the, the work that we do and how important it is in making fundamental decisions that will be imperative for the future of both our Earth and our space um, exploration. Randy, thank you so much for your time today. Best of luck next year. Thank you. This has been great. We continue to dig deeper with the Colorado School of Mines, where researchers there are working to uncover more cost-effective ways to discover and develop geothermal resources. Usually a costly exploration process, by combining big data and artificial intelligence, accurate footprints of potential subsurface geothermal resources can be unearthed in a cost-effective manner. The world is in energy transition. Geothermal energy has great potential. We decided to implement some of the methodologies that we developed for mining and oil gas exploration to use for geothermal exploration. We develop algorithms of machine learning and AI-based prediction systems to explore geothermal resources, and we call it energy resources intelligence because what we are doing is extracting knowledge from the Earth observation data and use that knowledge to predict geothermal resources. This is a huge innovation, and Colorado School of Mines is a place where innovation thrives. Companies that will ultimately produce geothermal energy will look at the research results we produce and hopefully implement that into the exploration strategies to find more geothermal resources. AGU TV is brought to you from the 2021 AGU Fall Meeting. You can find us in person at the Convention Center in New Orleans, in select hotels, as well as on the homepage of the meeting platform and online. From award winners to research center visits, it's all on AGU TV. To the high seas now, where the Ocean Sciences Division at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory perform lab work and field work to better understand ocean processes. From prediction models of ocean circulations, waves, and ice, to sediments and seafloor properties, the NRL's Ocean Sciences Division is a leader in ocean research and prediction. Let's see why this is such a great place for young scientists to begin and expand their careers. The Ocean Sciences Division is located at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. We're a group of almost 200 oceanographers all in the same physical location. As a young scientist who would come to the Naval Research Laboratory, I don't think you're going to find better facilities to help you do your work. You have great physical facilities, great computing facilities, great field work facilities, and you have this huge group of scientists here. This is a real team environment, and we have some of the best and brightest folks in oceanography, in sedimentology, in engineering, ocean engineering, that work for the Navy. We are scouring the world continually, looking for people who really are excited and energized about solving these problems. So we have a really diverse group of people who I have just insights and depth of knowledge that's wonderful to be with.
thank you very much for uh, coming. You know, the AGU community is so happy to see you getting the Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics. That's really great for climate science and for you, of course, in particular. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the importance of this and, and your achievements? Well, I first wanted to understand the basic theoretical principles of climate change. My first comment paper on the topic was the stochastic climate model, which provided an insight into the formation of long-term internal variations excited by short-term random weather fluctuations. I'm presenting these ideas in my first paper as director of the new Max Planck Institute. It was published in 1976 as part one of a series on stochastic climate models in the journal Tennis. This paper was is one of those which was apparently recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee as worthy of this distinguished prize. Do you think that our uh, educational system should be uh, adopted in order to basically be broader and, and favor these uh, different uh, multidisciplinary approaches to, to different problems. So, so how do you see our educational system needing to really respond to that? No, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I started my, my, by developing a basic equation for the energy equation, energy balance in an ocean wave spectrum. So this is uh, quite different from what, what you think I was doing <laughs> in, in the last years. So I extended the nonlinear energy transfer also to other wave phenomena, such as cyclic waves, and also to plasma physics. When I applied the Feynman diagrams approach to the latter, the idea came to me that I could understand elementary particle interactions through a new theory by adding to the four space dimensions eight extra dimensions representing interacting non gravitational wave, wave components as well as electromagnetic, strong and weak forces. Thank you very much for, uh, for all this.